I'm an, a journalist with a cause. And I've been so active against oppression, against radical Islamism, against the Muslim Brotherhood, and against CARE, which is the Council on uh, American uh, Islamic Relations. Uh, relations yeah. That are the, uh, I call them terrorists in suits, because these are the front of the Muslim Brotherhood. And CARE who groomed Ilhan, groomed Rashida, and many others, and by the way, in 2020, we have more, CARE has been grooming more than 120 uh, Rashida, Ilhan alike. This is the Rubin Report and I'm Dave Rubin. Quick reminder, guys, if you wanna see all our videos early and ad-free, join us at rubinreport.com. But more importantly, joining me today is a first-generation American, a journalist, and now a candidate for Congress in Minnesota's 5th District, you know, the one currently represented by Ilhan Omar, Dahlia Alakidi. Welcome to the Rubin Report. Thank you, Dave. Thanks for having me here. I am very glad to have you here. There's going to be a lot of stuff that we're going to unearth here today. Uh, but first, let's, let's do a little background. You are a first-generation American from Iraq. You, mm -hmm. you lived under Saddam. You have a really interesting story. So I hand it to you. Thank you. Who is uh, Dahlia? Dahlia is a, a journalist. Uh, I grew up in, in a very secular family. I grew up in a family of arts. Uh, both uh, my parents are considered pioneers in Iraqi modern theater. And my uncle, so I've been in, in like TV business since I was a kid. And uh, um, I grew up loving art. Uh, I grew up dancing ballet. Um, and then in uh, 1988, while, yes, people say I haven't suffered personally from the regime, um, we had everything that we wanted, but we didn't have the freedom. And life without a freedom is... Uh, it, it's not worth to live yeah. life without a freedom. So, so what does that mean? You're living a secular life, your parents are secular and successful, but you're not free. What, is, what does that actually mean? Um, we weren't, uh, we didn't just fear Saddam. Uh, the way his regime was, uh, um, it made you fear f f uh, f from your family members or from your relatives or from your neighbors. You couldn't even joke or mock Saddam or his family or his uh, government. You'll be, you'll be dead. So you had everything, but you can't speak. You yeah. can't give an opinion. You so for people in the arts, this has got to be doubly difficult. Definitely, yeah. definitely. Uh, and this is, uh, yes, my family didn't suffer. Uh, but millions of Iraqis have suffered, and, and that's the question. Is it just about me, or it's about the, uh, the whole country, or it's about the whole people? And that's when we decided um, to leave, my mother, my uh, little, very little brother, and myself. Um, even when we decided to leave the country, we couldn't speak at home. We would go, mom and I, we would go somewhere, you know, to a park and park our car and walk just to plan how are we going to, to flee the country. None of my family knew that we were uh, uh, leaving. Meaning that if you had talked at home, you think your family members would or have, it could would be have bugged, ratted you out or, or, or could, bugged or... Yes, wow. because my mom is a, a, a very famous actress and you never know who's listening to your phone calls, who's, uh, uh, who's listening to your conversation even at home. Wow. So you're too scared to say anything or to do anything. And we had friends that, uh, that their houses were bugged and they disappeared. They were executed for sometimes saying a joke or criticizing uh, uh, something. I mean, we couldn't even criticize uh, the wars that Saddam decided to, uh, to wage. We couldn't uh, criticize um, the way he, the mass murder that he did uh, in uh, Kurdistan, mm -hmm. which I'm half Kurdish. We couldn't. So this is not the life that 
anybody would want to live. I'm, I'm, it's it's uh, uh, suffocating when you cannot do something and when you want to make a difference, but, but you can't. So that's how we decided to leave. And we just, each one of us took two uh, suitcases and that's, that's it. We left everything behind. Yeah, I mean, did you just hop on a flight or what do you have to do to actually get out of an oppressive regime? Um, uh, thank you for asking this <laughs> because uh, in Iraq, you can't just... I may have to know in case the progressives take over in America how, how you get out, you know what yes. I mean? So I'm doing so this for self-preservation. Yeah, <laughs> so uh, if they, which they will never win, but if the socialists win, yeah. you, if you need to travel, you have to get a permission to travel and they would write in your passport, like if I'm going to Athens, let's say, they would write, she will go to Athens. I cannot go anywhere else. If I go somewhere else and come back, I'll be in trouble. I'll mm -hmm. be in jail. So what happened is um, I was back then, because I studied state, uh, stage acting and directing, so I was going to perform in Tunisia, a Cortage uh, festival. So I had the permission to leave. Mom had something, um, I think it was a movie or something in Cairo. So they didn't notice that because we were in different delegations, that's what they call it. Mm -hmm. So they didn't notice. Uh, so mom, because the ba she had a baby, so and she was supposed to stay more than one month. So she could take the baby with her. Mm -hmm. And our, we both left. I, um, after the, uh, um, the festival, um, I ran away from my team, from the people I was with, and um, I, I sent, I gave the Lebanese uh, uh, delegation or uh, my, my two suitcases. Mm -hmm. So nobody knows where I'm going because the head of this delegation told me, Dahlia, somebody is, gonna, is going from the embassy to stay here. So I had to run away and it was like, uh, I was 20 back then. And for me, it was like the longest journey. I didn't know because I left before mom, so I didn't know if mom left or not. Um, I was too scared sitting, I was flying to Athens, I'm from Athens to Beirut because that's where my aunt is, that's where I'm supposed to reunite with my mother and my brother. Mm -hmm. And uh, until, because the, the embassies, the Iraqi embassies during Saddam's era, they were the, um, the centers of intelligence. So it's so easy for them to grab you inside the embassy, put you in a box and ship you back, back mm -hmm. home. So anyways, to make the story, uh, the story short, um, I got my luggage at the airport from the Lebanese friends, and then I sat down and I was like, please God, please God, please God, until we took off. And when we took off, that was the freedom, for my flight to freedom. So that's when you flew, so you flew from Lebanon to America at that, oh no, 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 sorry. No, you, I flew you from, flew from uh, Iraq to Tunisia, yeah, and from Tunisia, to Athens. To Greece. And then, yes, and because I was Iraqi, uh, I couldn't fly to the airport because it was, uh, uh, back then it was uh, controlled by the Syrians. So I had to stay eight hours at, in Greece and then take another flight to Larnaca, Cyprus, and then take a 12 hour boat to Lebanon, to the Christian area. Yeah. And then, I mean, it took me like three days alone, not knowing anything, 20 years old, but uh, I made it. Yeah. When I reached there, nobody was waiting for me, not my yeah. aunt, not, I had the address, okay, take me there. I went there, it was during, you know, the mess in, in Lebanon. So I reached the apartment, it was on the 16th floor, no electricity, I left my suitcases after three days of non-sleep. I took the stairs to the 16th floor, knocked on the door. Mom, Jeez. holding my brother, opened wow. the door. I just looked and it's like, my suitcases are down. And I <laughs> slept for two days. 
Unbelievable. It's, it's like, uh, uh, it should be a movie, by the way. It should be a movie. Well, that really seems to be uh, only act one of the movie. Okay, oh. so now, now you're in Lebanon. You've reunited with your mom. Now what's the plan? Um, and uh, I got a, an offer uh, from uh, in UAE, from TV yeah. in Sharjah. So we went uh, to Sharjah, and that's when the uh, Saddam invaded Kuwait. So I decided to do a show to show solidarity with the Kuwaitis against um, uh, against Saddam, of yeah. course. So this is like 91 or something? No, 1990. 90, okay, yeah. And then um, we were contacted by the Iraqi opposition to work together to topple Saddam Hussein. Um, our part was to open a radio station called Radio of the of Free Iraq and, and Radio of the Iraqi Opposition. So we went to Saudi Arabia, and we were broadcasting from there. And that's when I met Chris Stevens, the late ambassador. Yeah, so can you explain how Chris Stevens, so the ambassador to Libya, who obviously died in the Benghazi attack, can you explain a little bit about your relationship with him? Uh, I've met him in Riyadh. I was in Jeddah, so I've met him in uh, in Riyadh, um, and uh, we became friends. And whenever he comes to Jeddah, we would get together, and and he's the one who can, who made it happen because at that time uh, we weren't like okay, we are living in Saudi Arabia. We had a uh, residency in UAE because of my, my job. But because of our background, my mom, myself, and I, have, I had a death uh, sentence issued against me when I was 20. And he's the one who, who was convinced and convinced me that I should go to the U.S. People like us should be... Uh, in the U.S. to have a brighter future. And he worked so hard with the State Department to grant us uh, political uh, asylum. Yeah. And uh, it's so sad that today I live here and he's not there. And I can never, never forgive Hillary Clinton for the loss of our four American patriots there. And yeah. at the end, she said, at the end, what difference does it make? Um, I've watched her hearings, and it was so sad. What else should we know about Chris Stevens? I mean, there were, there were three others as well, um, but he, he's the name that most people know. Um, he was such a beautiful human being. Um, he learned Arabic, and he, he has that soft heart that would... Uh, um, he's very... Um, not emotional, but he understands, you know? And he's the one who, when, when we talk, he's the one. And, and since then, I've been uh, twice to, uh, to the U.S. as a tourist. Mm -hmm. Because back then, when we were in Saudi Arabia, we had Saudi passports because we were doing this high-profile uh, um, work during that time. And... Uh, He just was one of the best people I've ever met. Um, he felt for the people, and that's um, for the past three years. I've been, uh, I was doing a show um, from DC, a weekly show for three years. About uh, it's called USL, US Libya. Mm -hmm. It's about uh, US foreign policy and US uh, strategies in North Africa in general, in, in Libya in particular. And the people I've worked with, um, the Libyans, that they remember him. And every Libyan I've met uh, has told me stories about him. And he, he was so committed to this country and to the people, the Libyans' people. And he never, um, he wasn't scared that this might kill him. Yeah. What is going on in Libya now? Can you do like a quick recap? Because it's sort of, we, we did this military action, Benghazi, the whole thing, and it's like, 
is it even a functioning country anymore? It's, uh, it's not so far, and the problem is because the GNA, which is the, the NGA, um, the gov um, GNA, Government of National Accord, is mainly uh, controlled by the Muslim Brotherhood. And then you have a general who was here in the United States as a refugee forever, General Haftar, who is so against radical Islamism. And then it's so, there, is, there is still um, a, a civil war, kind of. And uh, the UN, is, um, as we all know it, is a failed, a, a very failed organization that could, yeah. couldn't do anything. And it's just back and forth, back and forth, but hopefully um, meetings are coming with the Europeans, especially, that could reach or, or could convince the Libyans to, to at least sit together. For the average Libyan, though, do you think things were better under Gaddafi? It's or, or never, no. ever, it's yeah. never, ever better under a dictator. Mm -hmm. Never. Never. And I would say that about Iraq as well. Yeah. All right, so let's, let's get back to your story here. So when did you move to the United States? So I moved to the United States in 1993. As soon as I moved, um, I started working in the media, my mother as well. Um, and then I started um, doing uh, um, U.S. media in Arabic. And it's so funny because I was the youngest one. Um, well, you know Voice of America. Mm -hmm. And Voice of okay. America is a feder uh, federal uh, entity. So when I applied for it, there were like 400 something. And I just went and I did my uh, test, yeah. whatever. And, and then a week later, I was, because there was only one opening. Uh, and I got it. So even, the, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, really? <laughs> uh, but the first day I was at the office, all of them were so much older than I am. Mm -hmm. And they looked at me and was like, who is she? Uh -huh. But the first hour I went on air, everybody came and was like, now we can yeah. say, welcome to VOA. And that was a wonderful, wonderful experience. Don't forget, I came here, I speak English. Uh, so I came to the US speaking English. So it wasn't that hard for me to just be there. Plus, I love the culture, I love this country, and uh, it's home. It's, but, that's where my heart is. But I don't understand, Ali. I thought we're told all the time that America is an evil, racist, patriarchal state that no dark-skinned immigrant could come to and be treated fairly, especially if they come from the Middle East, a place like Iraq, something like that. You, are you listen a are lot you telling, to Ilhan Omar. <laughs> <laughs> are you telling me that's not true? And you, if you love this country and work hard, you might be able to make it? Is that what you're telling me? I've been here three decades. Uh, it was very easy for me to move somewhere and live if I didn't like it. Why would I stay here if I didn't like it? It's one of the most it's one of the greatest, it's, it's the greatest country in the world. And... Um, Is it shocking to you as someone that lived under what you lived under, had to do everything that you just laid out to even get here, when you hear all of this endless, ridiculous craziness about how horrible America is? Is it just mind-blowing to you? It provokes me that, first of all, let's talk about Ilhan Omar. And that's, that's very important. We were going to get there. There's okay. a lot of Ilhan Omar okay. stuff here. Yes, yeah. uh, because I truly believe that when you go to a new country and this country be, uh, becomes your home, I mean, at least be, be grateful that you, you have, you live in a country that, you have the right or of every single American. You're no different than anybody else. You have the right and you have the duties and, and that's how you should uh, deal with it. Yet, there are immigrants from different countries, I'm not saying from, it, or from um, that they come here and they don't integrate with the communities. So they still live in small 
area that it's basically they brought everything from their country and they're not willing to participate or, or willing to be part of the uh, of the community and that's what i feel that um, organizations and and uh, should work on on these communities to build bridges to to make them feel um, integrated um, in schools, in, in that workplace, and others. I mean, can you believe that someone who lives in, for 20 years in a country that can't even speak the language? Mm -hmm. How? You mean it's not racist to say that maybe you should speak the language of the country you live in? Or at least try to? I mean, <laughs> this is ridiculous. Racist? No, this is, this is the country, this is the language of this country. You want to be a, 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 a part of, of, of this country, part of the communities. You want to be, uh, uh, you want to provide, uh, uh, you want to fulfill your duties so you get your rights. I mean, this is, come on. I mean, at least speak the language. Yeah. At least read a sign. All right. This is ridiculous. Okay, I mean, so <laughs> we can link all of this to Ilhan, but before we get specifically into her, just tell me a little bit about what your general political philosophy is, because now that you're running for Congress, obviously that's, it's, it can't just be about, I'm against Ilhan. No, we'll, of course We'll get not. to that. But just tell me a little bit about your own sort of political beliefs. Um, a question that I've been asked so many times, thinking that all immigrants and um, their they should be Democrats. I'm a conservative person. I have conservative uh, principles um, since I came here. So um, being a journalist, I know exactly what these two uh, political parties are. Uh, so it's easy for me, I mean, uh, to be conservative and, and to be Republican. And that's what I've been since, since I, I came here. I truly believe that uh, decency should be back in our political arena and our lives. Uh, we we'll, we've lost it. We've lost it, and this is this is so bad. I mean, the hatred that we see now. This was never the narrative in the United States. Yes, we disagree, but we don't hate e each other. Mm -hmm. I don't hate somebody because he's a Democrat. Maybe I would never uh, marry a Democrat, but, <laughs> but that's, we'd be fighting all the time. Yeah, but, an honest politician. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but you know what? Uh, it's sad that you see in 2020 that hatred, uh, that um, the toxic narratives coming from the far left, I wouldn't say coming from the Democrat in general, the, the far left and the progressive mm -hmm. that are trying to destroy this country. People don't want this, this country to be a socialist country. People don't want to live in Cuba. People don't want to live in Venezuela. People don't want to live in these countries or even Russia for this matter. So we have people that are uh, praising these other countries uh, I mean, if you praise it and you like it so much, go uh, be a senator there yeah. <laughs> or a congresswoman. Right. Well, that's what I always say. Nobody ever leaves. Everyone exactly. Everyone still wants to come here. Nobody's <laughs> leaving. We're not stopping people from leaving, but they, they never leave. So uh, was it seeing what was happening with the, with the far left progressives and the socialists? Is that really what drove you to get into politics or was it specifically about Ilhan and then we'll talk more about her? Well. Being a journalist, and I've been doing it for a long time, and I do foreign affairs, and um, I cover the whole world, and covering wars, uh, uh, conflict zones, human rights crisis, um, terrorist attacks all over the world, especially in Europe. I've been there, done that. I've, I've, so I know what kind of, of outcome would come from a narrative like, like this. Mm -hmm. The oppression, the, uh, the hatred, the anti-Semitism. And I think uh, Ilhan Omar made the biggest mistake of her life. It was right when she 
got elected. And she didn't wait for long to bring out all the ugliness. Yeah, well, it was almost like day one. She suddenly flipped on all of these things, even and, though a lot of us could see it beforehand, obviously. Uh, yeah, but uh, being there so as a journalist, and I'm, uh, I'm very active. I'm, I'm an, a journalist with a cause. And I've been so active against oppression, against radical Islamism, against the Muslim Brotherhood, and against CARE, which is the Council on uh, American uh, Islamic Relations, uh, relations yep. that are the, uh, I call them terrorists in suits, because these are the front of the Muslim Brotherhood. And CARE who groomed Ilhan, groomed Rashida, and many others. And by the way, in 2020, we have more, CARE has been grooming more than 120 uh, Rashida, Ilhan alike that we're go going to see that. So what happened uh, with Ilhan that, of course, I saw a couple of her interviews. She's always on Al Jazeera with Mahdi Husseini, Hassani, yeah. Mahdi Hassan, yeah. that I can't stand yeah. because of his views, of course. Um, and he's so pro-Muslim Brotherhood. So I told my producers, I want to interview her. Uh, we were so ignored. And I kept tweeting to her, um, I was like, okay, now we're a Muslim to a Muslim, woman to a woman, a former refugee to a former refugee, da, da, da. And it was, um, I was ignored, and, and definitely she would not give me an interview. So I decided, you know what? because I was doing my research on Muslim Brotherhood and on all, all, all this, because that's what I write about when I'm not on TV. Mm -hmm. um, I decided, I said, you know, I don't want her interview. I'm going to her district. Hmm. And I went to her district and I spoke to the people and I was going back and forth, back and forth, spending time there. And even sometimes on Twitter, I would say, I'm going to be in this place from this time to come and meet me, journalists and others. Mm -hmm. So I had all this research about this district way before anything else. And then six months ago, I decided to move there. Uh, and I started thinking that if I run, I would be the best, the only candidate that could beat her because of my background I'm immune to her mm -hmm. uh, brand of identity politics. So I can push straight for the important issues and important discussions. And I'm no, not a shy person at all. And I could say, you are one, two, three. Why did you meet Turkish President Erdogan before you were elected? What promises did you, uh, uh, did you give him? why you refuse to acknowledge the, the uh, Turkish ethnic cleansing against the Armenians. Mm -hmm. Why were you outraged because President Trump decided to take justice to Qasem Soleimani? Why are you close to the Muslim Brotherhood? How much money have you been getting from care through or, or through care from Qatar and from mm. the godfather of the Muslim Brotherhood, I could do what no other candidates could. Mm -hmm. Basically, because if you tell her this, ah, you're white supremacist. Yeah. Oh, you're, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you're a Thai Muslim. Yeah. She cannot accuse me of that. So, well, she can accuse you of it, and I'm sure she will accuse you of it. it just she could will, be it my guest have, because yeah. the. the, the um, not very credible yeah. because I grew up in, uh, probably I know more about religion than she does, most likely. Yeah. Um, do, do you sense she's using religion as a shield? Of course. Uh, yeah. She's using everything and she has this uh, uh, victim cards that she throws at you. Oh, I was five, I have PTSD. I was five years old and uh, uh, no girl should live at war because any war and every war around the, the, the globe is because of the United States. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, 
Can, well, can you talk a little bit about the tactics? So you mentioned this uh, Muslim Brotherhood care connection. We mentioned, we talked briefly before we started about Brigitte Gabriel, who's really been laying this thing out for years, what the plan is to infiltrate. You're now saying there's over 100 candidates that are being groomed by them. But I think one of the tactics, which you sort of hit on, is this constant desire to make everything feel crazy all the time. And it almost seems like every time uh, Tlaib, in a way, Rashida Tlaib, is almost worse than Ilhan in this way, oh, yeah. that everything she says seems to be designed to make maximum chaos. And, and is that really part of what they do? That's the main thing that they do, and that's how they get support. I mean, Ilhan Omar or Rashida Tlaib, uh, 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 let me talk about each one because they have similar tactics but on different uh, issues. Sure. Like Ilhan Omar, when she uh, keeps feeding uh, uh, or tweeting or, or saying the same narrative over and over and over, uh, that I represent every Muslim uh, in the country. First, she's supposed to represent the 5th District. Mm -hmm. She's supposed to serve the 5th the fifth district, and she's done zero, nada, nothing. So when she goes and tells all the Muslims that the Americans hate us, the white people hate us, and they are so anti-Islamists, and that that uh, the Islamophobe, that the term that was invented by Care. Yeah. Um, so you, uh, we've talked about this a bunch on the show, but can you explain why the term specifically Islamophobe? was invented and why it's such a, a confusing term? To counterpart the anti-Semitism. So it's easier to say Islamophobe. So you could, okay, if you are an Islamophobe, uh, that's why you're with, uh, with others that hate all the Muslims in the United States. Mm -hmm. Well, number one, if they hated all the Muslims, um, I've been here three decades <laughs> as an adult. Yeah. How come nobody hated me? Well, I'm, I'm sure they hate me for right. different things. People probably hate but, you for your ideas now. Ilhan's probably not thrilled with you. Um, I, I doubt that. <laughs> but uh, even after 9-11, like 9-12, I've never felt threatened because I was a Muslim. I'm an American, regardless of all these. I don't use this. And the problem is, or I'm forced to use a Muslim former refugee immigrants just to uh, uh, the identity politics that she uses. Mm -hmm. And I stated it once on Twitter that was picked up by everybody because she said, I am uh, a hijab, oh. which is, that is not the right hijab that she claims to. And I've spoken to uh, several uh, uh, American Somalis that this is not the Muslim hijab. I mean, she wears the hijab regard, uh, based on the people that she's meeting. Mm -hmm. If she's meeting Muslims, she would cover, but hijab as in hijab, you cannot show your chest, you cannot show your hands. It's, it's, it's all... It's, it, Muslims know that. Right, well also plenty of the policies that she's for would not be policies that if you were a strict Muslim you would be for. I like, mean, health, abortion is a right? Uh, yes. Ab uh, sorry, abortion is health care. Exactly. Abortion is health care. And yeah. it's human rights as well. So, uh, but the problem with the people in the district that they don't follow what she does uh, in DC on a daily basis. They don't know that she missed half, uh, half of the votes that anyone else in the House. She doesn't vote for the district. You know when she votes? When it comes to foreign policies. Mm -hmm. That's when her votes. And can you believe that she voted against sending uh, aid to, to, Somal to Somalia? And then she went outside 10 minutes later, yeah. giving a press conference saying, oh, we did it. I mean, this woman is filled with lies. And again, her worst um, uh, mistake that she didn't give me the interview. And that what made me go back and forth. And that what made me decide that I am going to cross the line between being a journalist to a, a politician. 
So what are some of the other tactics that they use? Besides the just general, they want to cause chaos all the time and seem to always, everything they say seems to be designed to deepen that divide. What else, what else are they doing? The free handouts that it, on reality, doesn't work. How could you uh, give free health care to everybody? It doesn't work this way. I mean, where would they get the money from? How could you forgive all the student loans? What would they do for people that already paid their loans? Yeah, we're not getting anything back, right? No, yeah. no. How, I mean, all these handouts and, and like free this and free this and everybody's gonna have a free house and, and it's gonna have a free, I mean, this is ridiculous. We are not in China and even in China, uh, they don't do that. The, right. So, but can you explain a little bit more how the Islamists and, and CARE and, Mo and Muslim Brotherhood, how they use the progressives? Like, it's like, because this is what I think a lot of people, a lot of people see this match made in hell. You're supposed to be pro for progressive, but all these other values are completely anti-progressive. But I don't think people really understand the, how this thing fully ties together. Because the progressive don't have minds, <laughs> their right minds. The Muslim Brotherhood is using the far left and the progressive for their own uh, agendas. They're not doing it for the sake of the uh, far left or the, the sake of progressive. No, they are using them big time. Yeah. And so do, you do you think Bernie just doesn't get it? He just doesn't see it? Or he's so deep down the socialist ladder that he feels he has more in common with the with Islamists that, than, than with an American, the, the average American, something like that. I mean, uh, supportive or the BDS, what do you expect? I mean, if you're an American, and if you are worried about what's happening in that region in general, you want to be close and you want to defend your closest allies, which at this point is Israel. Now more countries are coming, like Saudi Arabia, UAE, Egypt, Who's going to counter Iran's influence in the region? Nobody. And I cannot understand why someone like Bernie that does not care about our allies. I mean, imagine him being a president. What's going to happen? Oh my God, we'll have uh, Iranian influence all over the place. Uh, uh, forget about something called peace uh, in the Middle East, and we'll have wars in the Middle, in the Middle East between our ex-allies and our new allies. Yeah. Uh, is, is that the biggest weakness of what the progressives are selling, that it all, it all kind of sounds good? It sounds good. I, we're for peace, right? Bernie, I'm for peace. We're going to sit down with everybody. Yeah, but it's how? Sad. How? Yeah. I mean, when President Trump went to Nor or, or met with the North Korean leader, everybody went crazy. Everybody, including, including the, the Democrats, the far left, everybody went crazy. Okay, he's sitting and talking and having dialogue for peace. So always for them, it's okay. For us, it's a no-no. So what else are you going to do in Minnesota's 5th District to supplant Ilhan Omar? Before that, I am planning and I will represent every every voter in this district, and not even a voter, every resident of the fifth district, because I am running to represent them. I'm, I'm planning to introduce Minneapolis and the fifth district to DC, not bring DC to Minneapolis and to that district. Um, she failed to do anything for them, and for me, this is, I mean, she's supposed to be a public servant. A public servant means that you serve your constituents. And that's what I'm planning to do. I'm, I will represent every resident of the 5th District, regardless of color, ethnicity, faith, and political affiliation. What do you think the Somali community thinks of her? So they are. Yeah. Seriously? They yeah. are sick and tired of her scandals, of her uh, uh, outside influences, of her uh, narrative that she is tarnishing every, the reputation of every Muslim, every American Muslim. 
and they know it now. Mm -hmm. And they, I mean, I speak to, I mean, to uh, in, in the district, I speak to Somalis and I speak to Muslims, and they, the majority agreed that she tarnished their reputation. People there are not waiting just for handouts. These are hard workers. The, all that they want is to have better lives, to send their kids to better school, to have a safe district. You mean the same is, thing as every other American? Exactly, yeah. exactly. We don't need names, we are all Americans. I don't, when I, when I travel, when people ask me, oh, where are you from? I don't say I'm an American <laughs> from, I am an American, period. And that's the values that I have are the American values. And the people I love are the Americans. Does it mean that I hate Iraq? It's always my, uh, that's what I was born. And these are um, my extended families. But when it comes to my heart, my heart is here. That's why I've been living here for 30 years and I'm not planning to go anywhere. And that's why I have only one passport which is the U.S. passport. Will you come on stage with me? I have a show in Minneapolis for my book tour in oh, May. Oh, I would you, love all right, to. All right, I'm gonna bring you on stage. We'll, we're gonna do some stuff. If you change your mind, I'll sue you. <laughs> <laughs> well, now it's, it's been recorded. All okay. right, I, I'll get you the date, but I'll be in Minneapolis around the May 10th or so, something I would like be that. honored yeah. to, to do so. That, that I would, would be, be honored to I, do so. Ilhan will not be happy with us. No. I'll invite her too, though. If she's watching right now, She's welcome to come on stage with both of us and we'll, we'll I've see had, what happens. I've been, I've, I've been inviting you for- Oh, there you a, go, yeah, you a, can talk to the camera yes, right there. Yes, a cup of coffee forever. So I think maybe we should have coffee in the neighborhood that you don't live there anymore because you moved to DC. So I'm in Minneapolis, <laughs> where is she? She's in DC. <laughs> yeah, can you talk a little bit about some of the other scandals related to her? Because there's, there's a lot of weird stuff out there. And for the last two years, it was only these very, I don't want to say very far right. It's, it was uh, seemingly far right outlets. I don't even want to say that. There were outlets on the right that are ignored by mainstream that were saying there was this weird thing with her and her brother and uh, passports and this whole thing. Can you, can you kind of get me up to speed on what we know I mean, know? usually I don't speak about it, but it's, um, I mean, there are investigations for uh, about so many things, like three, four, for me, one is many. Yeah. Um, and especially about the immigration fraud, because apparently based on uh, a, a community leader in, in the Somali community came out and including uh, pictures and, and let me tell you what happened. And then hopefully um, the investigation would lead to, because she would not, never talk about it. And it's like, oh, this is so appalling. Yeah. Well, so she's under investigation right now. Definitely. For immigration. Probably. Definitely. Yeah. Um, apparently, she had a brother who lived in the, United, in, in the United Kingdom, in London. And according to her close friends that went on the record saying that because her brother was gay, so she decided to bring him to the US, being inside the, within the Somali community, so maybe he'll get cured. This is the one wow. who, uh, who defends the LGBT community. Yet she wants to cure her brother. By being in this community. So he came, but as a uh, British citizen, he cannot live here. So basically, they got married, and to give him, well, it's not like for any other reasons. I mean, it's, it's, it's committing an immigration fraud, mm -hmm. and that's how he got his citizenship. Um, she brought him to cure him, and basically she used to say, according to her friends and to the people that went on the record, saying that he's been around uh, the wrong crowd in England. So it's better for him to come here and be around us. Right, okay, so putting aside the part about the gay brother and the curing, which is bad enough in and of itself, especially by her own progressive ideals, where she's exactly. supposed, supposed to be for gay people, but, but that's not criminal in and of itself. Marrying your brother for the purposes of getting him immigration, immigration fraud. status is immigration fraud, and this is under investigation right now. Yes. Do you think it's bizarre the way the mainstream media seems to be covering this up, or is that just 
sort of congruent with everything else that you I think, think we about got used to the mainstream media, uh, sadly, but we got used to it. Have we ever heard anything about anybody, uh, about progressive, uh, about a Democrat? No. It's always about the us, the conservatives, the Republicans. It's always about us. What about all the scandals that were around a large percentage of the Democrats? It's, it, it goes under the radar and they would, even if they mention it, they would mention it in, in, in times that are not very popular, so, and, and then that's it. And right. that's- Well, instead, the New York Times writes a piece about the new hip artist in town, Hunter Biden. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you saw that one in the Times. He's yep. the new hot artist in town. I'm pretty sure Donald Trump Jr. wouldn't get the same uh, coverage no. in the New York Times. Uh, uh, no, not even not Trump, not his kids, not his, oh, well, his children. D does it feel in a weird way? So for someone that, that was a journalist under a dictatorship, um, does that, or came from a country that was a dictatorship, does, when you see the way our media behaves right now. Similar. Similar, exactly, exactly similar. I mean, having, uh, uh, they always try to defend all the mainstream media. They pretend to defend the First Amendment, but what they're doing is so anti the First Amendment. Freedom of speech is the most important thing. Uh, they are just doing, and I know it. I know what the, that narrative of the progressives and of Ilhan or of Rashida, what they bring. I've seen the consequences of, of the hatred. I've seen the consequences of oppression and of division. I ran away from it, and I was fighting it for 31 years. And I am, as an American citizen, would stand against it from now. I was standing against it, and I will until the day I die. Yeah. Does anything about the machine that you're going up against scare you in any way? Just, I mean, at the most human level. I mean, I know you've been through worse in a lot of ways, but I'll tell you. But it's a big, it's a huge machine. Uh, uh, and especially when it comes to radical Muslims and to the Muslim Brotherhood and to the people behind the Muslim Brotherhood, they know. If you hear or if you read that I committed suicide, I'm not suicidal. I'm very happy. <laughs> so look for them <laughs> because definitely I'm not. Uh, we've seen suicides here and there uh, lately. And the, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood is a terrorist group. And the first thing would be my priority when I get elected in November that I will make sure the Muslim Brotherhood would be designated as a terrorist group, such as several countries, Egypt. That's where the Muslim Brotherhood uh, uh, was formed. Yeah. Egypt consider it, uh, uh, and, and other countries in the region consider it uh, a terrorist group, and we should. We should to, to um, I'm not scaring, I'm not trying to scare people, but we shouldn't be afraid of name or calling things with their real names. And that's not Islamophobe, that's not anti-anything. That's being anti-terrorism and anti-radicalism. And if I don't stand against it, who else? I know them, I'm from them. Yeah. So as a conservative and as a Trump supporter, I thought Trump was supposed to hate Muslims. Doesn't he hate Muslims? Doesn't he hate immigrants? Doesn't he hate brown people? That's what mainstream media is telling us. Exactly. Look what I'm doing and where, where I'm running. And most of my friends, when I, most of them are Republicans and are conservatives that we've been friends forever. And I've been doing some work with other think tanks, and especially when it comes to um, Islamism and the radical Islamism. And I speak to people, even to Muslims, and I speak to the Somalis in my district, telling them that she is not helping you. If you think that she's helping you, she is not. And they agree, because she has done nothing for them. 
I mean, she's for open borders. Do we, especially now with the, uh, with the coronavirus, do we, what kind of a, a country that doesn't control its borders? What kind of a country that is? What, what do you think about putting Ilhan specifically, so just peop, a first generation immigrant that comes to America that sort of has the gall to then just try to undermine everything? She's doing it for herself, yeah. and she's polishing her international uh, profile. I mean, she was more concerned to be on the uh, cover of Vogue than doing anything for her constituents. She is, I mean, I wonder, why is she sitting on the uh, Foreign Affairs, the House Foreign Affairs Committee? What does she know other than the hatred to well, Israel. She knows, she knows some people did something. Exactly. Right? She knows that one. Yeah, and I sent her a message from CPAC when I spoke that, you know what, some people are going to do something that will make you a one-term congresswoman. <laughs> um, so her endless hatred of Israel, you just spoke at APAC. you gave a, what I thought was a pretty incredible speech, and one of the things you really focused on, actually, was what's happening to the Christians in the Middle East, which is sort of a, a forgotten piece of the whole thing. Um, I guess, can you talk a little bit about just generally her obsession with Israel, um, but then more just what's happening with the Christians in the Middle East and, and everything else? Well, let's talk about the BDS that she introduced to the House. I mean, her hatred to, um, to not only Israel, to all the Jews in the United States and to every American that doesn't follow her narrative or that supports Israel. Um, there is a, a very big food company in, in our district in Minneapolis called General Mills. General Mills uh, does business with Israel and- They make Cheerios. Uh, Everybody yes, loves Cheerios. Uh, exactly. Yeah. And uh, that company, um, um, is employing more than 10,000 10, uh, people from our district. Because of her hatred or her uh, uh, obsession with Israel, she is willing to lose the jobs. I mean, to make the people of her district lose the jobs. I mean, what, what does it take, 10 jobs? 10,000 jobs, she does not care. She wants to satisfy her hatred to the Jews, to the Americans that support Israel, and to Israel itself. One mistake she did when, uh, if you remember when she and Rashida were invited by Muftah, which is a terrorist group, uh, to visit Gaza. Mm -hmm. And thank God the Israelis decided that this is not uh, the the uh, the good idea because Rashida Tlaib, in the name of the government, she would go to Gaza to bash Israel and bash bash Jews. Right. Again, the only place in the Middle East that has any of the seemingly progressive values that they might share. Pretty sure Hamas, not very progressive, right? Uh, Hamas? Well, uh, define progressive when it comes to bombings and when it comes to uh, missile attacks. No. Um, although, be before that, uh, Ilhan tweeted that Palestinians in the Congress had spoken. Since when do we have Palestinians in our Congress? She didn't even bother to say the Americans from Palestinian origins. Mm -hmm. No, the Palestinians in Congress, which made me like, do we have Palestinians in the Congress? I thought just we're supposed to have Americans in our Congress. Yeah. Uh, the, the best was, you remember when Tlaib tweeted the thing about being the first Palestinian in Congress and then Justin Amash, yeah. who's the libertarian in Michigan, said, oh, well, actually, my father's from Palestinian descent. I just don't make a big deal about it. Exactly. Because I'm American. Exactly, exactly. Um, although, I do feel for the Palestinian people because I truly believe that they are held hostages between Hamas, the terrorist group, between the corruption of the uh, Palestinian authorities and the corruption of, of uh, Fatah and... Uh, 
it's time for them. And they've tried. They've tried. But they've tried, especially in Gaza, where Hamas rules everything. You know what they do? Hamas, they would bring the truck in the middle of a residential area to launch missiles and leave a minute later. When Israel uh, countered the attack, who would die? Of course, of course them. The Palestinian people are sick and tired of this. They deserve and they want to live in prosperity and that's what the new uh, plan that President Trump uh, offered. And of course it was rejected by the Palestinian authority and everybody else. I mean, look so at Trump got So Trump got basically 20 plus countries, if not more, on board this. He basically got Israel on board it. Um, but it was basically, it was pretty much Hamas, the Palestinian Authority, Ilhan, and Rashida, and, Rashida. <laughs> and, and I don't know, and a couple others that, that were against it. Because and this then it's just plan, dead on arrival. it's based on reality. It's not like we've been doing the same, you know, that the, uh, the U.S. has been doing the same plan and keeps repeating it over and over and over, expecting to have a different outcome. I mean, that's so foolish because if you have this plan, did it work, it hasn't worked for decades, so bring something else. And what's great about this plan, I mean, it, it gives the Palestinian people the opportunity to prosper. And believe me, if they're not hungry, if they have more job opportunities, that's what they want. Mm -hmm. They don't want to wipe Israel from the face. Well, Hamas does, Rashida does, Elhan and Bernie, definitely, these people. <laughs> right, but, but not the, the Palestinian, average Palestinian, no. obviously. Yeah. No, do you think they enjoy their lives? No. And do you know how all these Palestinian leaders are living? They're living la vida loca. Yeah, they yeah. have the best houses, the best cars. They have... Abbas has quite a castle over there. Exactly. In, uh, and Ramallah. Hanan Ashrawi yeah. as well. All yeah. of them. And the people are begging for, for jobs. And uh, this would work, especially now more than ever, that Arab countries and Muslim countries are, are ready to normalize the relations and ties with Israel. Do you see that as like a mind-blowing thing that you've got all these Arab countries now that are starting to do have different bilateral relations with Israel and yet we have American Congress people who are further, who are more against it than Arab countries who've technically been at war with Israel? Well, Rashida could existence. feel free to move to Gaza and, and fight, uh, fight there. And Elhan could feel free to go to Qatar, maybe, or Turkey with the godfather of the Muslim Brotherhood. Just don't uh, spread your toxic rhetoric between us, because nobody's gonna uh, nobody's gonna stand this, and especially the consequences of what they are doing. Yeah. All right. So, what else are you gonna do for the good people of Minnesota's fifth district? I think we've we've laid out why they shouldn't vote for uh, Ilhan. What else are you going to do for these people? Uh, a lot. Um, um, my issue number one is uh, immigration reform. And that's not anti-Muslims or anti-immigrants. And that's what President Trump is doing. I'm, I'm, I'm the best candidate to defeat her and to help the administration uh, to implement all these laws because if I go talk to an immigrant or to an illegal immigrant and, and tell him or tell her that, you know what, there are reforms are coming and that doesn't mean that you'll be thrown out. It's just we have to be fair for the people that came here legally. We have to be fair for the people that waited for years, years and years in order for them to get the asylum. We'll work on, on, on the immigration, definitely, reform. Um, um, I am 100% supporter of the wall, and especially now, with everything that is happening. And if you think just we're, we're just trying to, um, to stop certain people from entering, no. Terrorists could go easily to Mexico or to other places and cross our borders. Mm -hmm. um, 
Uh, that's number two. Safety is extremely important in our district. Uh, Ilhan Omar, and I hate to keep bringing her, her but uh, in, she calls for less police presence in, in our district, while crime rate is going up sky high. Mm -hmm. um, we can improve the security throughout a legislation that would provide more funds. Uh, we can use all these new technologies instead of just putting people on the street. Security technologies are the best. There are programs that could tell you in, in this area where a gun was fired, right there, mm -hmm. live. We can do a lot. We can support the, the people of, of this district. Uh, healthcare, uh, we, uh, uh, I could promise that I would work with the administration, but you have the right to choose your healthcare provider. I'm not just giving handouts. We could push for s several con uh, companies that provide healthcare to their employees. Mm -hmm. The countries that, uh, the companies that are uh, treating the employees as independent contractors. We can do something. If you work certain hours for this company, you're no more uh, independent contract. Mm -hmm. So we can work with these companies to, prov to provide health care. And it's the choice of the person. I don't need to be forced to go to Dr. A, not to Dr. B. I don't need to be forced to go to uh, Hospital C, not Hospital D. It's my, f it's, 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 it's my choice. Individual choice and competition. You're a real radical. I, uh, well, yeah. <laughs> I, I, and uh, small businesses in our uh, district is suffering a lot. And we need to, um, to give the freedom of, uh, uh, or the choice of being an em employee of being a business uh, owner, um, the district could, could use a lot. And it's a beautiful, I fell in love with it from the day one that I arrived at, uh, in Minneapolis. It's such a beautiful place, that beautiful people. And uh, it could, I mean, Minneapolis should be just like LA, a metropolitan area that all tourists from all over the world would want to come and see. It has all the ingredients. We need to build more the inf infrastructure of this city. And it will be on the map like Florida, New York, DC, LA. Um, it should be on the tourism uh, map. Maybe not with now with the coronavirus and right. stuff, which by the way, all the, uh, all the far left, is criticizing the government and the administration, President Bush, for not doing anything. Excuse me. I mean, asking for 2.6 billion, I'm not sure if it's 2.5 or 6, to, uh, to support the research and, and to, uh, uh, to enhance all the medical research and, and medicine. That's not good. Why not good? I mean... Well, the orange man did it, so... Yeah. You know. This is ridiculous, and I think, I think it's sad. I mean, a long time ago, the Democratic Party used to be a decent party because it's all about two parties. I'm willing, and that's what I'm going to do for my district, to build new coalition, to reach not to the other aisle, to the last aisle on this planet, if that what it takes to provide the services that my constituents do. I don't uh, insult Democrats. Um, I don't keep insulting them. Like she, do, she keeps insulting the Republicans, even though she had Republicans in our district. Mm -hmm. So I'm willing to build much bigger coalitions. I'm willing and I will do everything bipartisan, and that's how the country should, I mean, it's politics 101. I have a feeling I'm looking at the next congresswoman from Minnesota's fifth district. You are. And as long as schedules line up, I'm bringing you on stage in Minneapolis in May. I wish I could remember the date offhand, but we're gonna link to the event right down below so people can join us. 
And for more on Dahlia, uh, go to DahliaForCongress.com. If you're looking for more honest and thoughtful conversations about politics instead of nonstop yelling, check out our politics playlist. And if you want to watch full interviews on a variety of topics, watch our full episode playlist all right over here. And to get notified of all future videos, be sure to subscribe and click the notification bell.